So first of all, okay, we are honored to ha have uh, Dr. Wolf as our speakers today. So uh, before we start, let me introduce him to our students. Okay, uh, uh, Professor Wolf is an Italian photographic artist. Uh, he is known for site-specific installations. Okay, and also land-based art. So uh, his work explores the time and space, the past and present, okay, the here and elsewhere with all the audience. So we are going to have about 45 minutes lecture and about 15 minutes Q&A section at the end. So during the lecture, okay, you are welcome to jot down any questions and you can ask at the end of the lectures, okay? So without further ado, let's give a big welcome to Professor Wolf. Okay, Professor Wu, so I will pass the mic to you now. Okay, so thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to share my experience as a visual artist, uh, photo-based, lens-based artist, and installation artist. And also, as you may know, I'm a faculty member of IED, the it Italian Design Institute in Milan. I've been teaching here for very many years. And uh, most of the concepts that we address in class stem from my experience as a visual artist. So although I greatly respect theories, I'm not a theoretician. And I must say that the, that the ideas that I tend to develop come after the production of my work. You know, I'm very perceptual in my work, but also extremely analytical afterwards. I greatly care for uh, meanings and I try to find meanings in what I do. You know, photography can be a highly perceptual, highly experiential medium to use. But then if I don't, cannot support my work with ideas afterwards, these works did never materialize. So it is very important that the image is also accompanied by ideas that I can verbally express. And I will show you a few bodies of work that can, um, that can explain what my work is about. So I'm going to start. Oh, first of all, I'd like to make this short premise about what the main themes of my work are. So first, the first theme that I address is time in the sense that um, paradoxically, my work is really timeless. It expresses some kind of timelessness. Um, photography can be very time specific in its making. Um, it can be very specific about the events the narrative, but in my case, it is like a suspended time. Uh, you cannot really tell exactly what went on if anything happened. You know, they really are timeless. And I have noticed this all through my work, that whatever photographic image I produce is not linked to a specific event. The second aspect, which I greatly care for, is the role of a viewer. Um, I care for an active role of a viewer in the relationship that we work can can um, can uh, establish with the viewer, I would expect the viewer in my work to to have an interactive position and not a passive position. The position of the viewer enormously changes the notion of what you see and how you see. The third point is the notion of experience, because all my works originate from a direct perception and experience in time and place. I don't create projects that eventually are materialized in the form of an image. I tend to first shoot, first encounter, first meet something in reality, and then charge this encounter with a symbolic meaning. That's when the work really is born. So there's a first and a second part in this process. And lastly, if I can identify a theme that connects all my works. Uh, I have discovered that this is the notion of the threshold, everything that joins and separates, the in-between, and uh, the very moment when two, these two polarities reach out to each other, the threshold. We will have the opportunity to develop these ideas while I show you my work. So I'm going to share my screen now. and start from my photographic work. Can you see everything well? Yes, yes. Good. So 
The first body of work is called Icons of Light. As you know, the etymology of the word icon comes from the ancient Greek and it means image. So these are basically fundamentally images of light. I have been photographing oil paintings in museums and churches from those positions that usually prevent you from seeing the actual icon, the painted image. I have placed willingly my, myself in those positions where available light, whether window light or, or spotlights, have pro produced reflections directly onto the oil, the shiny oil surface. So paradoxically, in these photographs, what you see is, I mean, you are like the witness of a double process simultaneously of generation and destruction, because the very light that generates the photographic image destroys the, pictor the, the pictorial one. So you see two things at once, the disappearance of a painting and the appearance of a photograph. And that appearance is witnessed by the very presence of a light in the shot. This spot of light that you see here was in fact the light that allowed the picture to be taken. It's like a virtual tearing off, like that of a fresco from a wall. The photograph removes virtually the object and brings it in an elsewhere position and situation. And uh, in a way, the photograph becomes the threshold between the appearance and the disappearance of the image, one and the other. You know, these two processes occur simultaneously. There's a physical representation of an, an unconventional retinal viewpoint. These are not orthogonal views. Normally we take photographs of things straightforward, but this was a rectangle. The reason why you see a trapezoid and not a rectangle is because the view was from the side. So technically speaking, what I do, um, I cut out, I cut out the photograph from the actual picture, this could be the actual picture, the rectangle on my 35 millimeter camera. And this image was cut out of it. It was eventually placed onto a thick uh, laminated foam board, which is shaped according to the actual perspective of the image. And it is eventually enameled. So you have to understand that what you're seeing here, even the frame, it's a photograph. So it's a two-dimensional image of a, of a three-dimensional object. And the shapes change constantly, constantly because of the original shape of the paintings and particularly the position of the photographer, where I was. You know, it is strange to think that over the years, a great deal of photography has striven to make visible. Photography always tries to show something, to make clear what was in front of the lens. Whereas in my work, uh, these works act in the direction of the apparition and disappearance. I'm really interested in this ambiguity of what I was able to see. In fact, the original oil painting acts as a mirror of light. And I never cared particularly about the subject matter. These are photographs of photographs. And this is the actual shadow of the photograph. As I said, I don't really care about what the picture depicts. I'm really interested in the interaction. And here you can see some uh, installation pieces. This is a polyptych of seven parts, which was shown on a flat wall and more recently onto two adjacent walls. So the work changes very much according to the point of view of the photographer to begin with, because that's the reason why these works are determined with these shapes. But it also changes very much with the viewpoint of a viewer, because if you move, you know, we don't see rectangles unless we actually stand in front of a rectangular surface, straightforward, exactly as it would happen with a camera. But because we know that the paintings are rectangular, we think that they are rectangulars. Therefore, we see rectangular shapes. But what our eyes actually see is really a mystery. 
and somehow photography um, reveals the mystery of the human gaze. It is analog to an extent, but very different from, from the way our eyes actually see things. I think that vision, you can say the metaphorically vision can come from illumination, but also from blindness. What these works show is what you cannot see, what you, in partly you cannot see. Every generative act contains an end, and every end contains a beginning. So I find that metaphorically these works kind of merge these two aspects, life and death, appearance and disappearance, presence and absence, here and elsewhere. This is what I call really the notion of the threshold. And also I have shown these works in museums not just like in contemporary art galleries, and have, and have been granted exhibition spaces in, um, in picture galleries. So it was really interesting how, you know, the interaction between, between these contemporary works and the traditional works. And here in this particular picture, you can also appreciate the shiny surface. You know, because the photography is really highly two-dimensional experience, I'm really interested in also operating on a three-dimensional scale, if possible, trying to give back some kind of physicality to the photograph, to recall the nature of the original nature, nature of the object. And in this case, it's an installation of photographs of photographs. So the second body of work that I'd like to show you are my horizons. So as a premise, if we intend photography according to its, to its etymology as a means to write by means of light, my horizons are scriptures of light, uh, writings of light self-generated during the process of loading the camera with film. So everything that you see here has to do with analog photography, with the loading process of a camera. During that loading process, the film is unwittingly exposed to light. And it's normally exposed to light without the intention of the photographer, just to prepare the next upcoming 36 pictures. I have personally focused on the first part of the film. These are discarded materials of the photochemical process the initial segments of the film self-exposed by light. So light radiations act directly onto the photosensitive material before any pictures are taken prior to time. And, and I'm very much care for this notion of prior to time. Everything happens before the picture is taken, before the time of experience of a photographer. Strangely enough, there is no direct authorship of these pictures. These are, these are film strips that I have appropriated from, from the trash bins in the photo labs. These parts of the films are, the, are normally discarded, but I found extreme interest in the way that I realized that these parts of a film already contain an image, already fulfilled the fundamental rules of photography time for how long light operated onto the photosensitive surface, chance, how did it happen? No one really controlled this process. By chance, film was exposed to, an, to this amount of light and particularly chance in the sense in the process, the photochemical process has acted in an inappropriate way because these uh, film clips are used to hold the pic to hold the films, or I should say they were used to hold the films in and out of the processing tanks. So these parts of the films were never processed properly. Now, this black part of the image is where you will eventually be able to expose 36 experiences of your life, 36 analog photographs. So I tend to place a threshold 
between the exposed part of the image and the unexposed part of the image. And this in-betweenness is really the line of separation, which is also the, uh, I mean, you can call it photogram, because as you can see, there's a very thin velvet strip that prevents light from entering the film reel. And it changes all the time. And there are never two identical images. It's impossible to produce two identical images because the light conditions in which the film was exposed and the time of exposure and the amount of light will never be the same. This is so very strange. You can say this is an, an off-camera process. I guess you're familiar with the notion of off-camera process, but this off-camera process happens in the camera while the camera is open. So technically these are not, these are not optical images by any means because they were not shot. <laughs> it is as if light were, was representing itself And uh, I may say that these works represent the borderline between photographic objectivity and abstraction. You don't see any object of a visible world here, yet I have come to think that these can be regarded as the very last analog photographs of the 20th century. And at this point, photography could do without any active present object outside the camera. The lens is no longer pointed towards the outside world. Rather, it looks at itself, its very language. These are exposures and representations of the very language of a medium. What is left to be photographed, I wonder? What is left to be photographed? So in a way, these are self-representations of a medium, of a language, of a reflection of light on a photosensitive surface, of a writing with light. These are the installation shots that show you how works are made in order to interact with the physical space where they are being exhibited. So the scale of a work counts to me greatly because this work somehow exists when it's seen in space and it has to challenge and interact with a given space. For instance, in this installation, I had the walls painted of a neutral gray in order to create the interaction between the two walls, one opposite, one in front of the other. Each horizon reveals a threshold the clear limit between light and darkness, matter and language. I have come to think that these are photographs before the picture. It may sound paradoxical, but before the picture, the representation of anything occurs, the photograph is already there. Light has already etched its message, its presence within the image. And also they allow you space to imagine because you don't know what exact what you are seeing exactly. You can mostly you can really imagine anything. Unlike the icons of light, these works are really, really flat. I think they emphasize the nature of the photograph to be a very a two-dimensional expression of light. The third body of work that I'd like to show you is called Mirror Thresholds. These prints on reflecting aluminum are produced by means of a direct UV inkjet print process devoid of white ink. When I realized that you know these large, really large industrial inkjet printers they can produce layers, layered images, 
but they normally don't employ the white ink. So basically where the image is inkless, you see the reflected image or what is in front of a picture. It is a fact that white technically doesn't exist in photography. This is, you know, when you have a white part in a print, it's because you're seeing the substrate, the paper, the white paper. So if you print on a mirror surface uh, where the image is devoid of information, because this part, this part which was white was overexposed to light, this part that was white actually reveals the space in front of the image. The reflection appears where, the, where a traditional photograph would normally be white. And this opens a whole new uh, doors of meanings to me because it made me realize how important the role of the viewer has become. It is extremely important that the viewer at one point becomes aware of being viewing the work no longer being a passive receiver of what happened then, but how much he is part of the conversation. The viewer becomes part of the work. So the absence of information simultaneously represents what lies inside and outside the work. Precisely where the surface is imageless, it embraces the phenomenolo phenomenological world what is outside in the world as much as the inner one of the image. The image has its own inner world. The image and reality are two separate matters. We need reality in order to apprehend, in order to appropriate, in, either, in order to represent something which is out there. But then when the pictures is shot, what becomes really fundamental is how the image operates what it shows and what you see in it. So in these works, the exposure, you know, we were talking about time, the exposure spans from the actual time of the shot, where and when the picture was taken to the present when viewed. It's like an expanded exposure. We talk about the, the, about the exposure, like 125th of a second one second exposure. Then here the exposure goes from the past when the object was seen by the photographer to the present when the image is viewed. So I'm gonna show you a few examples. When you look at the picture in a white cube, kind of space. It looks like an ordinary black and white photograph. But then when you view the work from a different point, you realize you're standing in front of it. And sometimes the same, this very same work was placed in a private apartment in a collector's house. And it showed completely, and it looked totally different when viewed from the entrance or from the side towards the living room, for instance. It's strange how the work is unstable. Normally the photograph shows a very fixed experience, a very fixed time and a very, very fixed space. But in, the, in these cases, the work seems to change according to the point of view of a viewer. And this notion of a point of view to me is extremely important because the point of view is physical from where you look at the world, from there, it will appear to you. But on the other hand, the point of view is a mental position, is how you see things, how you conceive them, how much memory, imagination, expectation, fears, how much they play an important role in what you actually see. What is it that we see and how do we see things? What can a photograph reveal of your own experience? not just of a photographer's experience, but of a viewer's experience. This is a series, it's a polyptic of portraits, but then the viewer sees 
himself, herself reflected within the image so that the image changes constantly. This was a site-specific installation that I was commissioned and studying the space, I'm always very keen on the nature of a given spaces. Um, I produced a diptych shaping three images and two images on the left and right, which looks, this is the view from the front door, but then things looked so different when viewed from above, walking up the stairs or walking down the stairs. So you may wonder what is the image actually depicting? What is it a representation of? What is it that the photograph holds in terms of information? The subject matters can be extremely banal, you know, like curtains, transition spaces, anything that is in between. But when the work hangs on the wall, it becomes extremely physical. You see how much it interacts with the given space. It is as if you could see through. You know, these were just curtains, basically, thin curtains. And uh, another aspect is that I make these extremely long exposures with a handheld film camera, you know, maybe two to three minutes. And when people come in and out, like for the ancient daguerreotypes, which, which were so slow exposure wise, anything that happens instantaneously disappears. You don't see the people who walked in and out because they were not recorded. All that was recorded is the barrier, is the curtain, is what stands between here and there, the inside and the outside. So again and again, what I had shot then and what appears now when the work is viewed are very different, may be very different from each other and may convey very different visual experiences and also open up the door to the viewer's imagination to the point that I've, I've been wondering whether the work is complete without the presence of a viewer. It is the viewer's presence that completes the work. So the, work, the viewer is an active part of the work itself. And I've been challenging another notion, which is why should a photograph have four square corners. Why should a photograph always be rectangular or sometimes uh, square? So I tend to shape some of my images. I tend to extract the matter that I care for from the original photograph. So taking the picture is fundamental. It's the inception of the process, but it is not its end. The end is really the birth of the image as you see it now, which can become almost an architectural element. The next body of work I have called Shiva. So these works hang on walls covered by black velvet cloths. They depict traces of a passage of time. There are imprints left on a black, or in this particular case, let me show you first what it looks like. Like this is an installation of 10 parts and the works hang in the gallery covered with black cloth. You don't know what's behind. You may not want to know, or you may choose to want to know what is behind the curtain. So first of all, I allow the works to be touched. 
Normally you cannot touch the artworks. Here you are welcome to unroll, sorry, to roll up the black velvet covers. You know, these velvets are the black most fabrics I was able to find. They're totally light absorbent. They become like black holes. You know how much light is fundamental to the photographic experience. So I try to cover these images with a highly light absorbent surface in order to reveal the image only once the image is intentionally viewed. And this is the point. I'm not interested in going to an exhibition and having the, the audience seeing the work with the tail of their eyes, you know, in a quick consumption of images. I prefer that the viewer can have a more meditative experience, that they can give time. And in order to do that, they have to hold and unroll the black velvet, and eventually it is placed over a groove at the top of the frame. And then this is what you see. You see the image and the viewer and the photographer who is taking the picture at the same time. So they depicted traces of the passage of time, imprints left on a black leather couch where museum visitors sit and contemplate the artworks. They look rather organic. Like daguerreotypes, they need to be preserved in darkness by the action of light and can be best seen one by one person at a time. So the use of a black cloth came to me many years ago. I was at the Metropolitan Museum in New York and uh, my attention was really struck in the, in the um, drawing and photography gallery my attention was struck that the only image which could not be seen was an image, there was something covered with a black cloth. And when I lifted the cloth, I realized there was this ancient daguerreotype under it. And two things about the daguerreotype, one is they're extremely light sensitive, they may fade away if they're constantly exposed to UV light. And the second point is that, as you probably know, daguerreotypes are printed onto a mirror surface so you can either, with your eyes, you can either focus on the image of the surface or on the image reflected by the surface. There are two focal planes. This was really the inspiring moment for me. But also, um, the idea of this series metaphorically relates to the Jewish tradition to cover pictures and mirrors during the mourning period that follows a close relative's death. During that time, for seven days, Shiva is the word for seven in Hebrew. During those days, traditionally, the family covers images and mirrors in the, in the house where the person died. And I was really struck by this tradition. And eventually, I also discovered that in Tibet, in the tradition of, uh, of Tibet Buddhism, images are only uncovered during the time of prey. I was really struck by this uh, notion because I strongly believe that images have power and they exert their power. They only exert their power during the symbolic time of the presence of a viewer. That's why the presence of the viewer is so really important. And the image is revealed from multiple points of view. Again and again, you look at the pictures from this side and you see the white. No, you don't see the white reflected. You assume that this is a black and white photograph, but this is not the case. This really is not the case. These were the images. These were the original files that I printed. And this is how they look. Technically speaking, this black that you see here, which is fundamental to the image, is achieved by means of three layers passed over the reflective aluminum surface. So that the black surface is really thick, like thick black velvet.
One more series that I'd like to show you are called meditations. And these meditations are produced. This is an installation shot. When a photographic paper has been exposed to an exaggerated number of negatives and so that it no longer retains the information of individual pictures. So the, photo the black and white photographic paper is placed under the enlarger in the dark room, and it is eventually exposed to an exaggerated number of different negatives. At this point, the excessive amount of information blackens the photosensitive surface, making the image retinally invisible. It is invisible because you cannot see any of the pictures that eventually overexpose that piece of paper, but they are also all contained within it. Yet you don't see them. We cannot see them because the exposure is so vast that everything disappears, which is another paradox of photography. Photography always deals with, a, with memory, right? The memory of the past time, something which occurred, something that actually happened in front of the lens. Whereas here, if anything happens still, it happens in front of the image. This image, it's like an image of all images that reflects the observer in the moment he stands in front of a picture. So you get a very vague, very vague reflection of the observer and of a space. It's a highly reflected surface, which is mounted over a, let's say an inverted light box. Basically the light shines not through the image, but towards the wall. This very this installation shot was exposed with the available light offered by the artwork. The work is reduced to the basic notion of a photograph, black and light, presence and absence of light. It is no longer about the representation of the object. In some way, it does retain the experience of the, of the photographer when he plays all those different pictures, no matter what pictures they were, in the negative carrier of enlarger and turn the light on and off, on and off, so many times until the image totally blackened. The work is three-dimensional. You can see here the opale white with a light diffused from behind. You can see even better here. So in my opinion, each meditation is a metaphor for our overexposure to the images of the world and their constant bulimic consumption. You know, years ago, I reached this point, having been involved with photography for so many years in my life, I really have, I needed a moment to stop to stop, to confront with totally black image, with an image which is no longer a representation of a definite moment in time and space. And also I've been, I've been wondering what is left nowadays to be photographed, which is may, may still be untouched by the presence of an already existing image. Have we not mapped the whole world already? Are we not discussing interpretations or reinterpretations of images? Are we not working on uh, iconography rather than a clear, direct view of something that we see for the first time? You know, I remember finding this sentence in an ad years ago. When was the last time that you saw something for the first time? How many images have already mapped our visual understanding of uh, outside reality. Is, is it still possible to apprehend, to capture, to take a picture of something unseen, still unseen? 
So my meditations are a blind gaze in a sort and a chance to see at the same time. A blind gaze because there's, it's we are blind because we see no longer, but it's also a chance to see. It's a light negated and revealed. Perhaps it's an absence from which a presence is born. These images are atemporal. There is no time depicted anymore. In my opinion, these are meditations on photography, on the subject, and on reality at the same time. And I can say that these images emerge from the ashes of the visible, from the end of any possible photographic representation. You know, I really wonder what representation means at this point. Representation to present for the second time and on the verge of using extensively artificial intelligence, you may wonder what, what a photograph actually is nowadays. Because the, the experience of a lens seems to be disappearing to an extent. <clears throat> we, we work on bodies of pre-existing images and we produce images that no longer need the lens aimed to the outside world. This is a picture of a photographer photographing his own work. So I call this a self-portrait. It's really strange how you appear in your own work as a reflection, but also as a part of the representation. And behind is the other work. So it's, it's like a mirror gallery, black mirror gallery. Still, the image is the center of the problem. What is an image? What can an image tell? Or if you wish to extend this question, can an image tell me who I am? As it has been said, the camera is always pointed outwards, but is always at the same time pointed inwards. So it's this in-between relationship between the outside object and the inner thought of a viewer, of a photographer. And the last body of work that I want to show you from the photographic side of my production are called scudi, which is the Italian word for shields. So this is what my pieces, my most recent pieces look like hanging in the studio. It's a triptych of uh, Basically, what I had photographed were blackboards being um, being erased outside in the open air in a shiny hot sun. And these blackboards were first wet and they were drying really fast. And I had photographed them at different moments and eventually printed my photographs on fabric and we did with, uh, with these uh, fabrics, I have covered these bodies of uh, high density, um, high density styro styrofoam to generate these shapes. So the language, the words, the text, whatever was written on the, whatever was written on the, um, let me go back. Whatever was written on those blackboards is completely erased. The language is gone. And the photograph shows these kind of abstract images that look some kind of primitive shields, like Aboriginal objects almost. When I took these photographs, I had no idea what I was going to do to connect with my premise the moment when I take a picture is entirely devoted to perception and experience. And eventually these images undertake a strong analytical process and they are transformed 
the real appropriations and transformation transformations of objects in reality. They never existed before in these shapes, yet there is still an umbilical cord that connects my work to reality. The next body of work that I want to show you are the um, some installation pieces. I have felt the urge to bring my work not just to photograph places and spaces, but also to bring the work back to where it belonged. So that's when I began to make these site-specific installations. This was my very first experimental one where I worked with a, with a group of students. We did this workshop together and uh, I produced a photograph of, uh, can you see this valley here? These, um, I really don't know the English name for it. These situations occur when it rains because, because the soil does not hold, um, is not held anymore. It's erased by the rain. So I have photographed one of these natural areas and enlarged it onto this ancient wall of a city in central Italy. So this, this was analog black and white photography applied with silicone over a 10 by six meters large wall and eventually cut to, to give back, to give back the, the wall, the, the stones that they made up the wall. You can see each of the stones and each stone corresponds to a fragment of a photograph. And this is what the photograph looked like from really far away. It became a black and white arch architectural fragment in the, in the urban landscape, very abstract, yet it became part of the ancient wall of the city. And this is what the wall looked like originally. So the space was marked and highly transformed. This is what you find, and this is what you come up with. In this case, I didn't use photography in the location. I used photography in order to map a black and white floor in a church, and eventually the work was transformed using marble grain onto this wall, black, white, in a mixture of gray, of which is black and white, um, grounded down marble. And also made the um, stainless, sorry, the, um, you know, the, um, gla uh, what they call the, um, the old technique for making, um, I can't remember the name, um, so using white, black, and gray glass. And they were like thresholds because in daytime, in daytime, these um, glass walls are lit from the outside, but in the nighttime they're lit from inside. So they really mark the passage between inside and outside of the building. And this was the, is the entrance door of the, of the house. So this is a permanent installation. So photography was transformed into these physical surfaces of the, of the house. And this is what the place looked like originally. You know, it is strange, it is scary, it is fascinating to see a place for the first time, and then you ask to think of an idea for the place, and eventually you go through a whole process before something like this happens. This is another work that I did in Northern Italy. I printed on uh, waterproof, UV proof vinyl. And this image was placed in a river. 
slightly submerged, just slightly submerged, is the photograph of a little stone of the rims of the rims of water expanding in water. I took the metaphor of the river, like the river of time, the passing of time. And uh, while the water was passing all the time, I was able to freeze one instant of time. And that frozen instant is depicted as part of this um, still water surface. It's very important to me that the photograph is not just a memory of an event or something that occurred, but it also participates in the present time of the viewer where and when it is um, presented. Rather than exhibited, it's presented. It's brought to the present time of the viewer. This is a photograph of the interaction of the water passing over the stillness of the water which had been photographed. This is was the this was the making of installation, the actual placing the print in the water. This is the uh, this is a rendering. It's a project that was not able to accomplish at the Venice Biennale in 2009. For a number of reasons, this work could not be accomplished, and I accomplished a different one. <clears throat> but the idea was to, again, to submerge, semi-submerge, an image of two rims of water that produce this sign almost of the infinite. How strange. How strange. You know, all of a sudden, you see these form produced in the water, and you instantaneously catch, freeze that moment, and then that moment is brought back into time and space in an arch architectural space at the Venice Biennale. And this is what the place looked like before. Whereas the work that I did produce for the Venice Biennale in 2009 was this one. It's the enlargement of a single 35 millimeter film shot where I pointed my camera towards a projector and left the shutter open for, I have no idea how long, maybe two, three minutes, handheld image. And, uh, and I took many pictures in front of this projector. And then I enlarged this one in this colossal size because I had to change to to sorry to challenge this colossal space. So the image had to relate with space and also had sound in the space. To me, this became an architecture of light. And uh, all through the process, I was con convinced to be seeing some kind of a pyramid shape here with light at the peak. But then many visitors reported a very different perception of the work. They were more aware of seeing the light at the end of a tunnel. And what they told me totally reversed the idea that I had, or what I had seen, or what I had not seen. What I had seen or what I had not seen. And the film, constantly, constantly recorded the action of light until what was out there disappeared and the camera somehow produced its own inner image. It's like a mental image. It's like a intangible image of something that happens out there or also within your mind. The work was also produced for a different venue and you can see the physicality of the object. The print is on canvas. It's a stretched canvas. So 
So as I said before, I care for the fact that the image is material as a photograph can be, can also become a very tangible physical object. Professor Wu, so yes. I think uh, we have uh, uh, seen a very extensive range of your work now. Uh, but be yes. uh, besides that, uh, you're being a photographic artist, I think uh, the student knows that uh, you have been involved in the education scene as well. So maybe uh, since we do not have a lot of time uh, left, so maybe you can show us maybe one or two works of your students before the seminar ends. Okay, so should we not see the videos at this point? We don't have uh, time. Maybe, maybe the video I could show them in my class, maybe, because yes, I think that's, uh, that's, I, that's a great I, idea. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, thank you. Um, so, I made a selection. I made a selection. Uh, I'm also, you know, I teach. I teach the first and second year in the three year course at school. And also, I'm a thesis advisor for, for those students who may want to choose me. And uh, it's really interesting for me to see, on one hand, how they have, they have absorbed the ideas which are discussed in class. And on the other hand, how much they're capable to transform those concepts, those notions, those ideas into their own work how the work is totally transformed through their own vision. And this is so fascinating, so fascinating. So I have picked three, four different students' work. Filippo Guerrieri, an Italian student, his work is called Masks. And we have discussed the notion of the masks in, in class extensively. So he engaged in a series of portraits of people using studio camera, large format, black and white, high contrast, very fine negatives. And, and uh, discussing the notion of the mask, we have realized how much the mask can conceal the identity of the subject as much as reveal who the person actually is. So he made these composite images where the same subject appears from two different angles, from two different points of view. You see the face of a person, but you see nothing behind. The eyes are almost blackened. What do we know about the others? Do we know their appearance? Do we know what they retinally look like? But can we possibly know what's behind the mask? What happens in a person's mind, who the person actually is? And how can a photograph reveal? How can a photograph reveal such thing? Since the photograph can only intersect the very surface of the object, the surface which is reflected by light, this is what you see. This is, what, this is what the camera can actually capture. What is the relationship between the outside visible world and the inner invisible world of the self? Filippo Telaro generated a work of forma and this was at the time when COVID had hit very severely Italy, probably before many other countries in Europe. So at that time, these students were really panicking because they had to work on their thesis, uh, on their thesis, but they couldn't go out. They couldn't leave home. You know, everything was done online. So first they experienced a high level of frustration, but eventually, they became extremely intelligent about the limits of what they could not do and therefore what they could do. And they worked without aiming the lens outside anymore, just using their own darkrooms, just using their own darkrooms, producing images of light 
on photosensitive paper and eventually giving a, a very physical appearance to these works using fragments that were positioned even on the staircases of their apartments in places in every day's life. And I found extremely interesting how these works were produced. They're entirely photographic in terms of scriptures of light and the black and white darkroom experience. But on the other hand, they just lived as object, silent objects in space. These are some examples of his work. And this other guy, Alessio Pina, he was stuck in Sardinia in this small town where he lived. He couldn't go out. He couldn't photograph anything. So because there was nothing to be photographed, he just used light and chemicals in the dark room. And he began to do something he had never done before. And I asked them to disrupt the rules, to try something, to challenge something they never did before. See how far you can push the experience of photography. And lastly, I want to show you the work of an excellent Chinese student that I had in 2021. And this is only a short, short list of some of the photographs on his portfolio. He photographs things that are already there, photographs in spaces with a very peculiar eye. His photographs become almost surreal, they're very mysterious. The like questions that he poses. These are wet photographs of his parents. I see his work like big, important, subjective questions that he poses to given reality, to what is already out there. And sometimes I think that the questions are more important than the answers. So one discussion we have in class is whether you can look at photography like in the form of questions. Every picture that they take is a question that they pose. And the answer can only come from the viewpoint from where the questions has been posed. Okay, so if you like, we can stop here. Yeah, because I think we don't have uh, a lot of time, unfortunately. So I think our lecture have to end here. But uh, before we start, uh, maybe we can like, uh, <clears throat> yeah, let's switch back to our views and uh, see if uh, we have any questions from our students. But uh, before asking the questions, I think we can all give a very big hand to Professor Wolf for a very, very extensive uh, work from different materials, uh, different uh, sets of design and site specific work. So is there any questions any of you would like to ask? I think uh, for the, all the works, it's not very easy to understand. Maybe at your levels, maybe you need some time to digest, okay? Even after the lecture, if you have any questions you want to ask about, then you can uh, ask me during my class, okay? Or even later on, you want to get in touch with Professor Booth, then you can uh, ask him through me. So I think that would be a great connection for you. So uh, is there any last word that Professor Booth, you would like to talk to our, uh, to our students before uh, we end? Well, how much time do we have left? Uh, actually, we have overrun a little bit and they, they have another class to have. Too. Yeah. Okay. I'd be very happy if you would like to share my videos with your students. Yes. Because you would see both of the videos are about transcending thresholds, the constant passage. As you have seen all through my work, something that I greatly care for are transition sites, places that connect and separate. So this is like a key to interpret those video works. Great. So they I think I... in actual spaces, in actual places. One is the Teatro La Scala in Milan, 
and the other one is the vault of a bank in Switzerland, the secret most place where they keep secretly whatever has to be preserved in a bank. Okay. And it's all about uh, it's all about making the invisible visible to an extent. Okay, so I think uh, I will show the videos maybe during my next class. So if they have any questions or even something that I don't know, that we will through uh, contact you through our other colleagues. Yes. So hopefully I'll we be can happy get to, to continue. More. I'd be happy to continue our conversations if you wish. Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you. So uh, Thank at you. the end, uh, uh, one last time, we have to give a big applause uh, to Professor Wu for your amazing time for your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, yeah, I think that's the end of today's lecture. Thank you very much. Yeah, so Thank now you. you can go back to your class, my students. Okay, okay, see you. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.